I start over here, uh, Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. Uh, that's where we got to, and we're talking about the sixth, the sixth angel pouring out the vial. And anyhow, uh, verse 12 says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings may kings of the east might be prepared. Now, I think we talked a little bit last week about how strange it is, or how not strange is not exactly the right word, but I guess it is strange, how, uh, uh, how the Bible, uh, this revelation in particular, was written by John uh, close to 2,000 years ago, and it is describing down to a T the way the world is getting lined up today. Uh, the river Euphrates runs right through the the Iraq uh, goes on up to, I think it goes uh, either into um, uh, uh, Turkey or up in that area, maybe in Syria. Can't remember exactly. But those are the those are the the, the nations that the, and you can turn on the news at any time, and that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the Iraq War. They're talking about uh, uh, the Kurds, which is in northern northern Syria. By the way, the Kurds are the descendants of the Medes. You know, the Medes and the Persians, that's the Kurds. Uh, uh, and and all, all this lining up, it even talks about Russia. Uh, I think uh, when you look over in Ezekiel 36, 37, and 38, the uh, Battle of Gog and Magog, uh, that is, uh, speaks about a, a, the nation or the city directly north of, of Israel. That's if you go take a globe and you go directly north, it goes through Turkey and then it goes into uh, into Russia. And so I believe that the, the alignment of the nations uh, that is beginning to take place is very similar to what the scriptures talks about in those different scriptures. And here it talks about the river Euphrates, drained dried up and the kings of the east. Well, the kings of the east is uh, is is well, the nearby it would be, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of that one, one country, uh, Pakistan. And then it goes over into India and then over into China would be the kings of the east. Uh, Pakistan, by the way, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is a nuclear uh, country. It has the nu nuclear weapons. Uh, Israel has nuclear weapons, but they don't admit it. I'm sure that they, they have them. Uh, but uh, they, they never have admitted that they do have. But uh, the kings of the east, and of course, would be, I think, uh, more than anything else, is a reference to China. And we know how China, what China is doing today throughout the world. It's, uh, very, it's, it's trying to take over and be in charge of everything. It's, it's wormed its way into America more so than we, we realize in many, in many respects. We talked about that some last week. But then verse 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So you see here, uh, first of all, it's confirming that there will be, there are, the, there will be the, uh, the, the dragon, uh, then there will be the beast, and then there will be the uh, false prophet. Of course, dragon, I think, is a, is a reference to uh, Satan himself. Uh, every time you see that, I think in Scripture you're talking about Satan and the beast would be the uh, uh, the Antichrist, if you will, and uh, the, the false prophet. The beast is given the description in several places. The first place over is 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 over in uh, uh, in Daniel. He talks about the the beast that was that was undescribable. Uh, that he had no all the other three beasts. I remember uh, that was the lion and the bear and the leopard. But there was no animal that he could relate to to describe the beast, uh, the fourth beast. And I believe that began with the Roman Empire. And then uh, in many respects, the Roman Empire still exists today. It's just, it's just uh, kind of went into the background, uh, you might say. But in many respects, a lot, of, a lot of the things that we have in our nation today are patterned after uh, after the Roman Empire, uh, like the Senate and uh, other things that go in our in our government. But anyhow, we'll talk about that more as we get along. Verse fourteen says, and "For they are the spirits of the devils, uh, working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world, 
to gather them to them to battle uh, on the day, uh, the great day of God uh, Almighty, which would be the, the battle of Armageddon. Uh, I think we talked about this some last week, but anyhow, I may have backed up some. But anyhow, the spirit of the devils, uh, these three spirits, the spirits of devils, the spirits of demons, it could be more than just demons. I believe it's probably spirits or uh, fallen angels, if you will. I think that's probably a better description of these of these spirits. Uh, it says they're uh, spirits of devils. Um, I won't go into all of that, but you know, a lot of the demons, I believe that their spirit, they come from the spirits of the Nephilim or the, uh, the uh, you know, over in Genesis chapter 6 when, uh, when they were destroyed by the flood. Uh, the spirits of those giants that it talks about, the Nephilim, uh, I believe are many, uh, are where the demons, many of the demons, if not all the demons came from. Uh, but I don't know if this what this is or not, or, for it, or if it is a, uh, uh, a spirit of a, of, of a, a fallen angel. Anyhow, verse 15 is a quote from, G I'm, I think we went over this, quote from Jesus, Behold, I come as a thief, blessed is he that walk, uh, Watcheth and keepeth his garments, uh, lest he walketh, wait, uh, walk naked, and they see his shame. Uh, Jesus is saying, I think this is a warning, a kind of a warning to us, or a warning to the, the, the believers uh, that go through the tribulation. Um, it says that they're blessed, is, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth. Well, that's what I believe is an indication of the rapture. He, I believe Jesus will come as a thief in the rapture. In other words, you won't be expecting him. Jesus said like this. He said, if you knew when the, when the thief was coming, you'd be prepared. Uh, you would wait up and, and, and meet him at the window or the door or wherever he was coming in at. But you don't know when he's coming. And that's what he's saying here. Behold, I come as a thief. In other words, you don't know. It goes along with what Jesus uh, um the, what, the way that Jesus explained it in the uh, in the uh, uh, Nazareth wedding uh, that that they would come uh, um, unexpected. The father would tell the son. The son would go unexpected to get his bride. But anyhow, it says that, and he says, "You're watching and keepeth his garments, lest he walk ne uh, walk naked." Uh, it's kind of like the ten virgins. Remember, there were five. Foolish and five wise virgins that were waiting for the bridegroom. And the, the wise ones had oil in their lamp, plenty of oil. The foolish ones did not. Uh, in the scripture, oil just about always represents the spirit, being being filled with the spirit and being dependent upon him. And so I think that that's what this is saying, that the spirit, uh, the ones that are blessed, are wall, keeps his garments, keeps his garments <clears throat> clean and ready uh, the ones that are are living, uh, living by the Spirit, uh, they will uh, they will be um, uh, I think uh, protected and gathered with Him. And verse verse eight sixteen says, and He gathered them together into a place called in Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Uh, this is like the parable. Remember that Jesus gave a, there was a parable over in in Matthew chapter thirteen that talks about. Uh, a, 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 a farmer, you might say, went out and sowed wheat in his field. And uh, shortly thereafter, his servant came to him and said, Some, the enemy has come and sowed tares among our wheat. Now, what do you want me to do? You want me to go out and try to pull them up and, and destroy them? And the, and the farmer said, no, let them both grow together until the harvest, and then we'll separate them. So I think that's what this is talking about. He's separating the tares from the wheat. And the tares are being, would be, he said, the, in the parable, as well as I remember, I might be wrong, but I think he said that they will be gathered together and burned, burned up the tares. Well, that's what's going on here. They're going, they're going to be gathered into a place called, in Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Uh, I've been there several times. Some of you, some of you have been there. Uh, it's a huge valley. Uh, the, the place where they take tourists to see it is up on a, uh, um, a dig where they have dug, dug a, a, a city out. There used to be a city there. It's up on a high hill. And you can go up there and see the ruins, of course, of that city or that uh, fortress or whatever it is. And you can look out over all that, all that uh, 
uh, that valley. And you can see uh, buses and trucks going across the middle of it in the, and it looks like little matchbook cars. They're, they're so small, but you can still see them going across, going across the road and going across that valley. Uh, it's, it's a huge valley. Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, um, Napoleon visited that area, and he said, uh, I, "I could." I, he said, "I could have a battle with the entire world in this place because the way it was laid out, you could, uh, it was a perfect place." He said for a battle. I don't know that the battle will be there as much as I believe they will be gathered together there. Uh, it says that they are going to be gathered together in the Hebrew tongue, Ar Armageddon. Uh, uh, and that that uh, tells me that, that that will be a gathering place, but it's not necessarily where, where all the battle will take place. Because later on, we look at the battle, and I believe the battle is in Jerusalem, uh, where the blood is as high as a bridle's or, 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 the blood is as high as a horse's bridle. I'll get it right in a minute. But anyhow, this, verse 17, then this, the seventh angel. Uh, the seventh angel poured out his vial upon the, upon the, uh, into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. That's very similar to what Jesus said when he was on the cross, when he said it is finished. The, the debt was paid when Jesus was on the cross. The debt was paid for all the sins of the world. Anybody that would can come and be forgiven and be washed clean uh, uh, from their sins. They don't, they don't have to do anything except to, it, it invite him into their life and into their heart. Uh, but that was what Jesus paid for on the cross when he said it was done. Here, I believe it says what Jesus is saying is through this whole scenario is finished, it's over with. Uh, what, what we are, what we are uh, talking about in these chapters, that's again, that's the reason why I say you can't take these chronologically. You have to take each, each chapter or each section as a, as a story in itself about what will happen. And they may overlap. One may be part of another, inside of another one. And vice versa, it's the, you can't you can't take it chronologically. You might say, but anyhow, it is done. And then and then verse eighteen says, and there were voices and thunders and lightning, and there was a great earthquake such as was not seen, uh, not since the men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. This is the greatest earthquake. There was an earthquake when Jesus was crucified. Uh, and remember the the uh, even in the temple it affected the temple uh, to the point that the that well I believe it was the Lord himself tore the curtain uh, between the holy place and the holy of holy places by the way that's not just like a little curtain like that it probably was that thick it was made up of of, of, uh, uh, of different types of material uh, that curtain was not uh, uh, a small curtain and it was torn from top to bottom. Uh, uh, and that, uh, there also indicates it wasn't torn from the bottom up like somebody grabbed it and tore it, but from the top down like the Lord tore it. And what he was saying in, in that, by the way, was, was that uh, the way between the holy place and the holy of holy place was now open. Man can come in to the holy of holies and, and, and be received. Uh, that, the, the, that, that the price has been paid and the way has been made for man to come into the very presence of God. Before that, it couldn't be, that couldn't be. Uh, but now, uh, now since, that is, since the, Jesus paid the price, it can be. But anyhow, it says this, would, this earthquake, though, would be a much greater earthquake. It says voices and thunders and lightnings. Uh, there was a great, uh, uh, during this earthquake, and it says, and the great city was divided into three parts, uh, and the city of the nations, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of of the wine, of the fierceness of His wrath. Now this is the first mention of Babylon. We're going to talk a lot about Babylon in the next chapter or two, uh, especially in the next chapter. But it says the, the, the great city was divided into three parts. 
Uh, there's some debate about who the great city is. Uh, is it the great city of the, of the Antichrist? The city that he uses as his uh, uh, cap, capital build? Or, is it, or is, it, is it talking about Jerusalem? Could be talking about Jerusalem, but it's divided into three, three parts. And it says, and the cities of the nations fell. Um, that's interesting because this must be a huge, uh, a huge uh, shaking of the earth uh, if all the cities of the nations uh, felt the reaction of it. Um, some, some, some liberals, you might say, well, well, they're just talking about the cities around in the Middle East. Uh, I, I think when it says uh, the, the nation, all the, all the, uh, all the uh, cities of the of the nations fell. Very possible, I believe, that it's talking about all, all the uh, nations of the world. I see, you see on these, I see on these um, uh, I don't know what you call them, they're programs about nature and that kind of thing when it talks about uh, the poles and the poles have shifted scientific, supposedly stuff. Uh, there are some that say that ever so often the, the earth does that number. I don't know if that's what it's talking about. But it, the poles reverse. I don't know if it means the uh, the magnetic poles reverse or if the actual poles reverse. But there are those that speculate on that. I don't know if that's what it is, but whatever it is, it's going to be a great a great shaking, and I believe it will be a great shaking over all the earth. And it says, and and came remembrance of God to give uh, to her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of His wrath. Babylon. Talk about Babylon for just a minute, and then we're going to talk about her some more when we get into the next chapter. I'm not quite sure how far we are yet. <coughs> Babylon, of course, we know that there was the, the city that was the Nimrod. It's the first one to mention Babel. Um, uh, he was going to build a tower uh, to the sky so that he could be God and, uh, and reach, reach to the heavens where God was at. And of course, God came down and said, "If I leave these alone, they'll they'll nothing that they'll be able to. There's nothing that they won't be able to accomplish." And what did He do? Remember what He done? He fixed. He changed their languages. He make, mixed the languages so they couldn't understand each other. And so when they done that, they scattered out throughout all the world. That's where we come with different languages. Uh, if I've been told, I've not done it, but I've been told that people that study languages and the, and the roots of languages have come to the conclusion that all languages come from one root language. <laughs> Makes sense to me. That's where, that's where, because that's what God did. Uh, in Hebrew, some of the, uh, some of the words are very similar uh, to English. Like, for instance, the, the letter Gimel uh, the picture of the gimbal is, uh, I think I was telling somebody that last week, is a, the, the, the form of the letter looks like a camel, but it's called gimbal. It's very similar to what we call a camel. Uh, that's just one of them, but there's others that, uh, other not just letters, but there's words in the Hebrew that sound very similar to, uh, to uh, uh, English letters, like the word, I don't know, the word wine, we call it wine. In Hebrew, it's yain. It's very similar. Uh, and it very could be, very well could be uh, in other languages, too, because they all come from that one root language. Now, this is just my speculation, but I think David Mills and me have talked about it. And I, I tend to believe that the, that the root language was Hebrew. Uh, and I believe, personally, that there's no scripture in it uh, there's no scripture about it, but I do believe, well, there is some scripture about it too, actually, uh, that uh, in the in the kingdom, we will all speak Hebrew. Uh, me and me and David used to used to uh, kid each other, says we, well, if we learn Hebrew, we'll be ahead of the rest of them. <laughs> 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 we'll already know it, yeah. But I, that's that's just a, we just kidding around, you know. But what but what I do I do believe that it's very possible that Hebrew. The reason I say that. It's because Hebrew was a dead language for nearly 2,000 years. Nobody spoke it except they, they did speak it in the synagogues uh, during just like, just like Catholics speak uh, 
in the, their churches, they speak, uh, what is it? Uh, Latin. 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 Nobody else speaks Latin. Latin is a dead language. Nobody, no nation speaks Latin. But Hebrew is, was a dead language. It's not dead today. It's been resurrected. There was a guy by the name of Eliezer Ben Yehuda, uh, I believe was his name, and he decided he was going to start uh, having his family to speak Hebrew. And he started, he started taking the Hebrew language, and he realized that there was lots of words that we that today that is not in the original Hebrew, like television. Oh, he didn't have television yet. But there was a lot of words because this was in the 1800s. But, but he did have modern languages or modern words that didn't match, didn't match uh, the old language. So he had to come up with new, new, new uh, words for it. And so that's what he did. He combined uh, two, maybe two or three Hebrew words to make a word, another, a new Hebrew word that meant this, that or the other, whatever. But this, this he, first of all, he started with his family. He insisted that his family always speak Hebrew in the house. And then he started going around to schools. Uh, this was in Europe somewhere. I can't remember exactly where at. It was before Israel existed. Uh, but anyhow, today, to make a long story short, today, uh, the Jews speak Hebrew. One of the, thing, if, one of the things, if a Jew uh, has Aliyah, which means go back to Israel, uh, the first thing they do is start taking lessons on how to speak Hebrew, if they don't know how to do it already. Uh, the, like the Russian Jews, they had to learn how to speak Hebrew. Anybody that uh, moves to Israel has to learn how to speak Hebrew. That's the na language that they speak. And if that is the language that they speak, and this is my theory, if that's the language that, the, that, that has been resurrected by God, and that, but by the way, there is a scripture, I wish I could look it up for you right now, but I can't remember what it is, that says that the language will be, re will be resurrected, that Hebrew will be the spoken word of the, Jew of, of the Jews when they come back. You see, for 2,000 years, the Jews were no longer speaking Hebrew. They were speaking Greek, or they were speaking the, na the language of the nation they were in, German, or English, or wherever they were lived, that's what they spoke. But when, they, but when Eleazar ben Yehuda started, started uh, bringing, them, bringing that language back, today, that's the <clears throat> main language spoken in Israel today. Uh, most of them also speak English. Uh, which is nice. Uh, a lot of them, can, you know, they can understand you. But anyhow, uh, uh, Babylon, uh, I kind of really chased a rabbit there, but Babylon came from came into remembrance of God. Why is Babylon? What is important about Babylon? Well, there was the, there was the, uh, there was the Tower of Babel, but the real Babylon didn't, uh, didn't really come into existence until, uh, uh, until uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire, uh, the head of gold, remember, of the, of the four uh, different uh, types of uh, uh, ma uh, material. He was the head of gold. Uh, Babylon, uh, is, you, see it, you see it throughout all the world. You see uh, uh, the makings of, of the, the, the remnants, you might say, of the Babylonian uh, way of life. Many of the... Uh, I don't know what, how to put it. Many, many of the uh, things that we celebrate, I guess you could say, is based on Babylon, Babylonian uh, 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 traditions, and Babylonian worship. Uh, you, the, you know, and during Christmas, you have the Yule log, Yule tide. That was what the, that was part of the, the Babylon, Babylonians when they would uh, in the winter solstice. They would burn a, a Yule log. Uh, that was um, uh, it was something to do with Tammuz. I can't remember all the ins and outs about that. But uh, the goddess Ishtar had a son by the name of Tammuz. And Tammuz was uh, um, was put to was killed somehow or another by gored to death by a pig uh, around the winter solstice, and they would burn this Yule log. Uh, some, had something to do with that. And then, then uh, Tammuz was resurrected in the spring equinox. So it matches very similar to what Christmas and Easter. And, and, and this Tammuz was resurrected, supposedly, 
And uh, another thing about, and we'll talk about this too, another thing was about the, um, uh, it's either Eshtar or, or Isis. I think the Greeks called her Isis. Um, or it might, it might have been the Egyptians. But it was all the same god. It had about three different names depending on what nation you were in. Whether it was Egypt or, or uh, uh, Babylon or Rome. They all, I think Rome was Diana, I believe, was what they called her. But she... Uh, she was born by, uh, this is another thing, she came down to earth supposedly in a huge egg and the egg broke open and that's where she come from. And and she had a, a boyfriend, I, I, I say a boyfriend, but it's, uh, what is his name? Uh, I, I can't remember all their names, but it's Apollo. Apollo was born, was her boyfriend supposedly uh, I, this is kind of hard to get into, but I, it's kind of. But Apollo and her was had Tammuz. Okay, remember I mentioned Tammuz. Well, uh, Apollo had a brother that was very jealous, supposedly, and he killed Apollo and cut him into fourteen different pieces and scattered his pieces throughout all the world. Now, this is all their. This is all their teaching. Well, uh, Isis or Ishtar didn't want to put uh, Apollo back together, so she did. She went and got all the pieces of a, and put him back together, except for one she couldn't find but one piece. The other 13 she found. You know, the piece, the piece that she couldn't find was his male organ. And that is where, that's where the obelisk comes from. The long, the, the Washington Monument, and it's male. It represents the male part. And you go to the other end of, of it, and you got the in here in America, you got the Capitol building. It's got a dome, right? That's the female part. You understand what I'm saying? And that is that's what you see all over the world, and that's where it come from. Come from Babylon, and come from Ishtar, and come. Uh, all that uh, is uh, is a, uh, a significance to, to many people. One of them be one of those people. One of those groups is uh, is very significant too. Is the uh, I, hope, I hope I ain't stepping on no toes. Is the uh, uh, the uh, Supper in Catawba. There, there's a, got a place there in Catawba. The what? Freemasons. Yeah, Freemasons. That's what I was trying to think about. They, they, they buy into a lot of this stuff. But anyhow, that's I wanted. I'm kind of laying a little groundwork by telling you this, because we're going to get into it even more so when we get over into the next chapter. But anyhow, uh, that's the representation. Did you know? I will tell you this: is that that they that. Uh, when a leader from a nation, uh, or especially here in America, I don't know about the other nations, but when we, you know, where, where does the where does the president take oath of office? Oath of office in the capital, right? In the rotunda, where the that's where he comes out of and he takes the oath of office and goes back in. Uh, that is supposedly anointing him to be, uh, from their standpoint, anointing him to be possibly be their final leader. Uh, they have a ritual going on at the same time that we are uh, uh, inaugurating our president. They have a ritual going on of, of supposedly uh, Ishtar and, uh, or Isis or whatever you want to call her and uh, Apollo getting together and creating a new uh, Tammuz again or a son, which would be the president or who, in our case, the president being inaugurated. You see the, the parallels there? It's birthing a, uh, birthing a leader. And so uh, that's what they believe. Uh, they're, they're also, another thing about uh, under, the, under the dome, under the Capitol building in America, there is a, uh, um, a 
room. And it was a room that they built for uh, Washington to be buried in. And he refused to do it, he wouldn't do it. So nobody's ever really been buried there. But there is a room under the rotunda that's, that's a mausoleum for a leader to be buried. And some believe that that will be, uh, that is an indication of the resurrection of uh, Tammuz or whatever it would be. Uh, that's all speculation on their part, uh, but there's a lot of people that, be, take my word for it, there's a lot of people that believe that, like the Freemasons and others that get into, involved with that. Now, they don't, if they're, if they're low-level Freemasons, they may not know about it. But when they get up into, I think, a 32nd, 31st, 32nd degree up high, and, and uh, they know they, they learn all this stuff about what, what and it's other, not just the Freemasons, but I think there's other groups too. But anyhow, let's see where we got to. The earthquake, the great earthquake. And a great city was divided in three parts. And I, again, I don't know exactly who that city is. It's probably, I think it might be uh, uh, Israel. The thing about it is, Israel, Jerusalem today uh, is divided, into, but it's divided into four parts. You got the uh, Arab, the Muslim, the Muslim set quarter, the, the Jewish quarter, the Christian corner, and the Armenian corner. Armenian is a different type of Christian type belief. But it is divided even today. And it says in verse 20, verse 20, we'll go a little bit further and then we'll stop. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. That was a huge earthquake uh, that, that all that took place. And there fell upon men and a great hell, great hell out of heaven. Every stone about the weight of a, of a talent. I've heard that's about 100, 100 pounds. Uh, that, that's big stones. Uh, about a weight of a, of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of hell, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. Instead of repenting, what did they do? They blasphemed God. You would think by this point, and knowing that what all was going on, that they would uh, repent and say, God, have mercy on me. But no, they, they blaspheme God because of what's taking place, uh, because of the exceeding uh, torture that they went under. But that ends up that chapter. But again, you can see that uh, it's going, uh, it kind of covered a, a whole gamut in that particular area. Does anybody have any comments or anything they'd like to add? So every, every island fails. So like Hawaii, uh, anything that's surrounded by water is an island. Right? Yeah. So I mean, smaller. Yeah. Right? I guess so. The well, is that's. Bigger, but and then the mountains fell. Is when the mount or the mountains? What did it say they did? They went. The mountains weren't found, so they were flat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's very possible that that, that uh, when the islands. If if uh, if a great earthquake occurs, there's going to be a lot of uh, shaking, and not just in the earth, but there's going to be a lot of uh, <coughs> stirring of the water. There's going to be a lot of uh, uh, tsunamis. I think is the right word. So they'll probably cover many of the islands. I think that's what it's talking about. Well, if the if the mountains fell, then you know. Yeah, it would cause I mean, great. We've been on some mountains. Yeah. Uh, God, God is, I believe, it, this is my opinion, but I think what God's doing is setting it up to recreate the recreation of the earth, fixing it again like, it used, like it's supposed to be. But I might be wrong. But that's what it's doing. Uh, that hail, uh, 100 pounds, uh, that's, that's a, that, there ain't many cities going to survive that. Yeah. It would it would kill you if you hit yeah. you. If you hit you, yeah. It's it's going to be a uh, going to be a rough time for them, for whoever's on the face of the earth at that time. Next week we're going to get into Babylon, because next week is a uh, um, a detailed look at Babylon, and I think it's strange. Don't don't you think it's strange? Before I get into it, it's strange that. Babylon is mentioned here at the very end. It's 
it's way back in history, but now Babylon is, and, and there's no city, there's no nation called Babylon. There's no city today called Babylon. There's the ruins of Babylon in, in Iraq, but there's no city. So where is this coming from? What is this Babylon? In fact, when we get into the next chapter, um, uh, there it is called not just Babylon, it's called Mystery Babylon. So we're going to look at a great mystery next week. I think you'll find it very interesting. You may not agree with everything I say, but uh, there again, I think it's a good way of looking at it. Uh, there's a lot of speculation about where Babylon is or what is Babylon. But we're going to talk about it next week, and uh, I might. Uh, I think you, hopefully, hopefully you won't get too mad at me, because I might rub some feathers the wrong way on that one. But uh, let's look at Babylon next week. Anybody got any comments? Well, over here in some chapter, it calls it Great City. Yeah, the Great City Babylon. Mm -hmm. Well, that may be the case. That may be it instead of Jerusalem. That's a good good point, Patty. Appreciate it. It could be that that's the city that's divided into three parts. <clears throat> but I do know that I do know when we get there next week that Babylon will fall, uh, and we'll talk about that. How could it fall if it don't exist? If we don't know where Babylon is or what what, what is Babylon? How can it fall if it's not in existence? Right? It has if to be. It's us. It's the United States. It has to be in existence somewhere, or it has to be in existence, to come into existence somewhere in the future. In the clouds. In the clouds? Yeah. In the clouds. There will be Jerusalem will come from the clouds out, out of heaven. The new Jerusalem, but not Babylon. All right, let's all stand, and we will, we will get back in. We will be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we do praise you and we thank you for the, for the many, many blessings that you've given us, for the opportunity that you have blessed us with to be here this morning, uh, uh, for the health and the strength that you've blessed us with. Be with those on our prayer list that you will give healing and restoration, Father, to them. Meet their needs according to your will. Be with those that couldn't be with us this, this morning. Uh, bring them back next week and may we, uh, uh, may we uh, fellowship together as we study your word. And I pray a blessing now over everyone here. Yevarechacha Adonai Veishmarecha. Yeer Adonai Panavilecha Vilkanecha. Yesa Adonai Panavilecha Veasimlecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, his peace. As always, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. In Shem Yeshua, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good head, y'all.